move out to the field or head onto the track or to the sponsor area, that'd be, that'd be great. Well, I'm really excited about this uh, next talk, and uh, I met uh, Anna uh, about a month ago at Chaos Community Day, so we go uh, way back, and Paul and I met a couple minutes ago, so we, uh, we're, we're new friends. So anyways, uh, we're excited for this, and uh, they said they're going to do, they, they got the headsets before, it was just going to be like a normal talk, but then they decided we're going to do epic rap battle, so I'm excited for that. That's good. <laughs> oh, you guys didn't know that. Okay, cool. Uh, All right, it, you guys... Can you stop for a second? So, um, <laughs> we're really, we're really uh, excited to have everybody here today. Uh, and th whose first time is it in the stadium? Like you're kind of, you're like, all right, yeah, it's cool, right? I always struggle whenever I come here because I went to the University of Oklahoma. Yeah. I don't care. I don't care. Yeah. I don't care. We, Big 12 champions uh, for a lot of years, so I'll just live with that uh, booing. And I, I've lived in Austin for a long time. It was, it was, uh, we good? Yep. Okay, we're good. All <laughs> right. See, I had to unveil something personal about myself. All right. What's hey. a chaos engineering talk without a little last minute stalling? Well, we're also embracing chaos. We just tried getting our speaker notes up, and they're not up, so we're just going to go with it. Yep. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you all very much for coming to our talk. Today we're going to be discussing how to embrace chaos and how to bring chaos engineering practice into your organization. My name is Anna Medina. I currently work at a company by the name of Gremlin as a chaos engineer. Prior to this, I've worked at companies of all sorts of sizes, from small credit unions to big enterprise companies, as well as doing college research. You can find me on Twitter, where I talk a lot about mental health, diversity and inclusion, as well as DevOps and chaos engineering. And my name is Paul Osman. Um, my title is Senior Manager, but what I really do is I lead the SRE team at Under Armour. Uh, we have a large office here in Austin. Um, previous lives, I've worked at places like PagerDuty and SoundCloud and other uh, organizations where I had some involvement in doing kind of either OPSI stuff or chaos engineering directly. Um, I tweet less often. Uh, I'm a poor Twitter user, but you can find me on Twitter where I do talk about ops and uh, <laughs> being on call and whatnot. That's my uh, daughter. She's two, so she knows a lot about chaos. They're the perfect type of chaos engineers, right? Exactly. Just so. Breaking stuff. So Anna, could you uh, maybe introduce us to what chaos engineering actually is? Yeah, so for some folks, this actually means just breaking things on purpose and being like, cool, I did this, this is how I expected it to fail, and this is where it's headed. Well, now that I work in a, an organization that has a chaos engineering platform, we've come up with this definition that chaos engineering is thoughtful, planned experiments designed to reveal the weaknesses in our systems. This is not about just randomly breaking production. This is not about doing chaos engineering in a very unthoughtful or a very unplanned way. For some folks, they rather say that they do chaos engineering to make sure their ops team, their SRE team, like takes the call. But that's not necessarily what I would say is best practice. I like to do it more in a thoughtful, planned way where you communicate to other engineers that you're going to be performing this. So I'm sure a lot of you have seen this meme before. Who, who's seen this meme before? Disaster Girl. Um, and I love Disaster Girl because she's so applicable for so many ops-related topics, being on call, systems breaking, complex systems. Uh, and we thought to use her for chaos engineering. But it turns out there's more to this story. Um, this girl's name is Zoe Roth, and she's a teenager now. Uh, she lives in North Carolina, and the actual story behind this picture was that uh, there was a fire on her block, and her dad was like, oh my gosh, what's going on, and let's go see. And it turns out like, the whole block had gathered around this house, and it, you know, it seemed pretty safe. The fire department was there. There was a large fire, presence, uh, fire department presence, and it turned out that this was not a random uh, accident. This was actually a controlled training exercise that the fire department were doing uh, on this block, and they were in complete control the whole time, controlling the blast radius of this, but this was to give firefighters an actual real-world experience before cutting their teeth on actually going into the, into the force. So, you know, that kind of speaks to what we're here to talk about. Uh, as Anna said, you know, chaos engineering is not thoughtlessly breaking your systems. Chaos engineering has to have 
a, a philosophy to it. It has to have an approach to it. And the way I kind of think about that approach is it's very similar to the scientific process. So, you know, there's a bunch of different ways that organizations go about implementing this, but the way that, you know, we tend to do it at Under Armour, and I know a, no a number of other companies uh, tend to approach this, is you start out by documenting your attack scenarios, right? If you're thinking about running chaos experiments on a part of your system, you think, what could go wrong? Um, it's sort of, you know, another uh, fodder for jokes amongst ops folks is like, what could go wrong? Well, that's a great question, actually. <laughs> you should be asking yourselves this. So once you figure that out, you know, create the experiment. Actually think about how are you going to force what could go wrong to go wrong when you're all there watching. Um, and, you know, I actually missed putting this on the slide, but the, the important part there is what do you expect will happen? So when something goes wrong, a database goes out or a network fail, uh, fails or packet loss, you know, skyrockets, how do you expect the system to respond? And then as you're doing the experiment, document the result. You know, actually be, have somebody who's like a scribe sitting there taking notes, documenting the timeline as you're going through this. And, you know, be prepared to roll back. So, you know, another part of the theme of don't just thoughtlessly break things, uh, have a plan. You know, if something does starts to go wrong, not the way you'd expect, how do you get back to a known state as quickly as possible? And then perhaps the most important, um, some organizations actually just stop there. And, you know, we call that kind of like reliability or resiliency theater, you know, like you went through the exercise, everything's really, you know, you feel good, you're developing the muscle memory, but you're not improving. You're not actually taking those results and translating them to action items. So one of the most important steps uh, and the final step of the sort of, you know, feedback loop is to make sure that you schedule those action items. Like, how do you get the system to respond the way that you thought it would if it didn't, in fact, when you tested it? So for some folks, you're still maybe not grasping on why you would want to break your stuff. Well, we like thinking about chaos engineering with the analogy of chaos engineering being like a vaccine, where you inject something harmful in order to build immunity. And this was a quote that the CEO and founder of uh, Gremlin has said. You can find him on Twitter too. He also talks a lot about chaos engineering and his experience of doing failure injection over the last 10 years. Raise your hand if you have been on call and gotten paged at two in the morning and hated it. Okay. Raise your hand if you've just been throwing a pager and said, hey, you're on call. Yeah, for the most part, those are two of the storylines that we see a lot in SRE and DevOps where you kind of just like expect it to always be on and expect it to know how everything works and even if the run book's 100, days old, you expect everything to be better. But what if I tell you that these two things can actually get better by doing chaos engineering? You can actually onboard your engineers to on-call. You can actually onboard your engineers to production by doing chaos engineering. You're able to do fire drills with them that allow them to get into the mentality of what they're gonna be doing when they actually get paged. And at the same time, if your systems are gonna be failing always, kind of like what Murphy's fourth law kind of like tells us, everything will fail. Well, you wanna be preparing for that failure. You wanna have that muscle memory. You wanna know exactly what you need to do in case something actually goes wrong. So, you know, I love that idea of actually using chaos engineering to onboard people. Um, I've always kind of told my team at least, like the first time you see that cliff in a graph on a dashboard, shouldn't you shouldn't be alone. Um, but what do you need to do to like start getting there? And you know, this is, this is a topic that obviously is highly dependent on your company's culture, highly dependent on your team. But there's a few things that I think you should have in place before you just randomly start going and breaking stuff in production. Um, the first and foremost is you should have a documented incident response process. Um, you know, this should be more than just when things break, someone gets emailed, someone responds to it, someone fixes it. This should be something to do with like who's on call when, uh, what escalation policies are in place, how do you do follow up from incidents, um, and so on. If you don't have this, just go to PagerDuty's documentation. They've done a great job of open sourcing like their internal processes for incident response, including role definitions and you know, severity definitions. Just take that. If you're starting from scratch, uh, I certainly would. 
The next thing that's kind of inherent in that is that your engineers should be on call. Um, I'm a firm, firm believer in you know, people being on call for the systems that they deploy to, that they make changes to. And you know, otherwise, you're going to have a disconnect between the people who are empowered to make the changes and the people who are testing those things in production. Uh, you should also practice blameless postmortems. Uh, there is an amazing article, if you haven't read it, out there by John Alspa, who was the CEO of Etsy when he wrote this, called, I think it's like, Blameless Postmortems in a Just Culture. And the idea behind blameless postmortems is when something breaks, it's not someone's fault. That's not good enough. That's not a great answer. You know, you can't just point it and say, human error, this person messed up. Um, first off, that's going to incentivize people to hide failure. Secondly, it's going to actually prevent you from finding the real causes of these things, because that person was probably following some process or using some tool that another person will do, and you're going to have that failure again if you, if you end at that. So practice blameless postmortems. Um, it's also hard to get people to actually break things if you're going to blame them for things breaking, right? <laughs> it's, it's not a great culture. Uh, and then lastly, uh, and you know, perhaps most importantly, have some monitoring and alerting in place. Um, you know, I think I've heard uh, some people say things like, if you can't see the impact of an experiment, don't do it. You know? um, one of the parts of the preparation for us at Under Armour is we, we document like, what, what metrics we expect to be changed and how we expect to see that when we're actually performing a chaos experiment. And that's part of the whole feedback loop for us. So let's talk a bit concretely about Under Armour. Um, how many people know Under Armour as a brand? Almost everybody, that's great. How many people know Under Armour as a software company? Fewer, <laughs> that's what I thought. OK, so we got some work to do there, that's OK. Um, so Under Armour, for those of you who aren't familiar, perhaps, we actually have some fairly large consumer uh, applications. So we are the uh, company behind Map My Fitness, um, My Fitness Pal, Endomondo, and UA Record. How many people know of any of those brands? Yeah, more people than said that they knew Under Armour as a software company. So, um, but that's great. You now know, you know some of the, the products that we're dealing with here. So um, each of these products is interesting because they have different user bases. There's obviously overlap. They have different usage patterns. And they have different purposes. One purpose that I find really interesting, or one way that this affects user traffic and how our users use our product, is MyFitnessPal, in particular, experiences this huge traffic spike on New Year's. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure there's at least one person in the audience who's done this. I know I have, where you download an app on New Year's, and you're like, New Year, I'm going to use this every day. And you know, of course, that that's a really interesting thing for us. Some of you do, some of you don't. And we actually have data behind that, which is super, super interesting. Like, how long is the average retention? And what do we do to try to keep that retention, right? Like, obviously, we want to try to keep as many of those newcomers as possible, knowing that we won't keep everyone. But um, you know, we'll certainly have a worse time retaining you if you're a returning user or a new user if you experience some kind of availability outage. And that's your first impression of MyFitnessPal. So, so this was actually a great uh, opportunity for us to introduce the practice of chaos experimenting. And we uh, kind of dipped our toe in. It was a really early kind of version of chaos engineering. What we did was, you know, every year we went through this pre-scaling exercise where we said, OK, we're going to have this massive spike. What can we do to also kind of limit the blast radius and cascading effects of certain kinds of failures we've seen in the past? And one of the failure scenarios that we had been, uh, that we'd experienced in previous New Year's uh, you know, events was where an integration with the app would actually take down the app. And so this was like you're using a step tracker, a third-party step tracking device or something like that, and you've connected it to MyFitnessPal. And then all of a sudden, you know, because so many users are using those step tracking devices, maybe because they got them for Christmas and they turned them on on New Year's, um, you know, it was taking down people's ability to actually add food entries or exercise entries to MyFitnessPal, and that wasn't a great story. So, you know, engineers had worked on a kill switch for these integrations. So, okay, in the event that these integrations start to misbehave, we start to have scaling problems, we can just turn them off and prevent that error from cascading out. So, that's great, but we actually said to ourselves, that's not good enough because we haven't seen it actually work. So you know, this is part of the experimenting thing. Um, you know, we did the work, but until you actually see it happening, preferably not at 3 AM for the first time, you don't know that it's working. So 
what we did was we got you know, the whole engineering team together, we invited product, we invited QA, uh, most importantly, we invited customer happiness to actually sit with us and go over a game day on this portion of our infrastructure where you know, we went through every runbook that we had, like if this happens, turn this off, if this happens, turn this off, and how are we gonna practice all these kill switches? Uh, and it went great. You know, we, we turned off certain integrations for five minutes in production. Um, you know, that's certainly customer impact, but that's better customer impact than being unprepared when all of a sudden a queue scales up to 100 times its normal size and that error cascades to the rest of our app. So since then, uh, we've had great luck evolving our chaos engineering practices. We've started running game days approximately once a month um, in various parts of our uh, uh, application services infrastructure. So you know, other areas where we've started using this is every time we're developing a new system, we actually have the team go through and document you know, what are the ways that this can fail, and then my team, the site reliability engineering team, sits with them and kind of acts as consultants to say like, well, let's do it, like, let's make sure it fails, and that way we can gain confidence in our systems. Another way we've started to uh, incorporate this into our overall processes is, is actually in our high severity incident tracking process. So uh, every week I get together with a group of leaders in the company and it's actually an open meeting. We go through all of the incidents that have happened that quarter. And uh, I sort of think of like the life cycle of an incident. So, you know, we have some problem in production that maybe affects customers. Um, that happens. That's the first stage of an incident. It happened. The second stage is to have that blameless postmortem. And you know, our SLO on that is we try to have a blameless postmortem within one week of a high severity incident. We don't always make it, um, but that's what, we, that's what we strive for. That's our objective. After that postmortem, we have action items. So that's the third stage of the incident, uh, identifying those action items and actually codifying them as you know, JIRA tickets or whatever your task management system is or your work management system. Uh, the next stage is the work was actually done. So, you know, this is where you escape the theater part, right? It's easy to identify action items. It's harder to actually do them. Um, but to my point earlier, the incident still isn't done, done, done. Uh, and, and coincidentally, that's one of our corporate values at Under Armour is we getting things done, 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 right? It's not good enough to just say, ah, oh, I think it works. We want to actually see it happen. So the last stage of an incident is that we verified it. And the way that we usually try to verify these things is by running a chaos experiment to say, all right, we've got the fix in place. Did the fix actually fix the cause? Or did we miss something else? And you know, there's been a ton of stuff that we've learned uh, by doing things this way. Uh, Anna and I were talking about this approach, and we actually kind of characterized it as like the game of life almost for an incident. It's like all of the different life stages that the incident goes through, which I think is a fun way to think about <laughs> it. Hey, so I'm back again. So I actually got started on chaos engineering in a very interesting company that y'all may have ever heard of or actually even used. I got started by actually getting thrown into the SRE team at Uber as my first job in infrastructure ever. So it was an interesting place to actually have to ramp up very, very fast on systems, infrastructure, DevOps, SRE practices, as well as getting put on call my second, third week at the company. But it actually made it quite fun being part of the chaos engineering team and being like, hey, you have all these services running on the service that you're now an engineer at, well, you can actually go sit with them and actually learn about the active ac architecture of how they've actually built the systems, as well as talk about some of the outages that they have dealt with, so you can help them come up with chaos engineering experiments that they can later execute. So chaos engineering at Uber got started around 2015 after they had a really, really lar large outage caused by their API. The, there's a good talk about it by Matt Rainey, uh, who spoke at a few conferences in 2015, 2016, about how they actually grew the microservices by learning to embrace failure and just constantly break things. So for Uber, they were completely bare metal. When they looked around for chaos engineering, a lot of folks end up looking at the open source tools that Netflix has created including Chaos Monkey, Sumerian Army, as well as some of the other ones that they have talked about in their blog posts. 
Well, Uber running on bare metal, they look at Chaos Monkey and they're like, hey, we're not running on AWS. We can't just randomly turn down instances. So how do we get the concepts that Netflix has started putting in place in this open source project and then bring them on board? So in-house, they built a chaos engineering tool called You Destroy. This had a UI that you're able to perform the chaos engineering experiments through there, as well as taking input from the CLI. The way that it worked is that it takes the request and then this gets handled off to the workers. The, the hosts that are currently running those services have an agent installed. They actually are the ones that are getting a push from the workers that tells them this is a chaos engineer experiment you're gonna run. The one thing that I kind of wish I would have put earlier on the slides is that whether you're building your own platform for chaos engineering using open source or buying a product, you need to make sure that you think about safety. And for safety in chaos engineering, that means having a shiny red button that can stop all your chaos engineer experiments if you actually see in your monitoring alerting observability that something goes haywired. So even if you're just running with scripts, having that scripts that automatically kills all the other processes that script was running was great. The way that Uber actually did this is that we did it like in a scheduled setting of um, you destroy experiments, as well as randomly doing it in order to kind of like verify that things were working properly. This is actually some of the screenshots of the tool. This is what it looked like in 2016, 2017 when I was there and working on this. Uh, I've gotten a chance to talk a little bit with the new manager for this tool and it has changed a lot. It has been completely rewritten and go as well as I think Uber is moving some of the stuff to the cloud as well. And then I recently was able to find a talk that was done at a microservice meetup in Seattle by one of the engineers working on the chaos platform at Uber. Her name is Deanne. And she actually talks about how the tool has changed and what they're thinking about doing up next. But some of the things that were very basic in Uber doing this chaos engineering was doing some of the chaos engineering experiments of blocking all the traffic from one microservice to the next. I should mention that by the time that I joined, Uber was already at 1,000 microservices. There's a talk of June 2018 that they actually mentioned that they're around 4,000 4, microservices now. So in just 3,000 years, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> just, just 3,000 yeah. years. In about three years, they actually managed to develop a few other 1,000 microservices that they also have to constantly be thinking about how one microservice failure failing in their ecosystem has ca cascading failures upon other systems. And this was a later, more interesting project that I was very glad that this was my first project at Uber. I later moved on to the cloud infrastructure team trying to move Uber from bare metal to the cloud. And when we were doing the first run of trying to run a trip on the cloud, it was interesting to also realize that you have to really map out all the microservices that are running your trip. So it was really cool to see how chaos engineering taught me on how things actually were working, but we still didn't have that whole, these are the route that the, the service takes on your microservice space of this company. So the way that Uber was able to embrace the chaos engineering was very interesting. They had embedded SREs that were able to go sit with um, like the highly critical services and tell them about reliability, try to preach best practices to them. But apart from that, we also have put res resources in teaching education classes on what chaos engineering is, why you should be embracing failure, as well as on like how to actually use the UI and the CLI. Then they also were doing drills in order to kind of think about um, what actually happens when we have our high peak days, which is kind of a little bit interesting to Under Armour because the two peak days that like Uber really sees worldwide is Halloween and New Year's Eve. So they, they when they do capacity planning, we're constantly, well, they were, at that time we were constantly thinking about those two days. So are you able to completely fill over an entire data center in case something goes wrong, as well as, um, we had you destroy for doing chaos engineering, but we also had another tool called Hailstorm that did load testing. So for, for preparing for these high peak traffics, we were actually doing load testing on chaos engineering 
part of this fire drill of preparing that game day for these days that were going on. When I was about to leave Uber, one of my engineering friends on the SRE team, she was working on a tool by the name of Gatekeeper, where they were actually gating deployment to production until your service was active, active completely, which was actually really cool. And one of those requirements was actually to set up your service on Udestroy, run some chaos engineering experiments, and then Gatekeeper will show the checklist of this service is actually resilient, and we've actually been able to do a failover from one DC to the next. And about a year ago, I decided to go back into uh, chaos engineering. And I found a company called Gremlin that currently is like, we're a SaaS company that currently offers a chaos engineering platform. It, the UI kind of looks like this, and it's very interesting to us because yes, we love preaching that folks should be doing chaos engineering, but we also practice what we preach. We make sure to think that we should also be resilient as a company, but we'd also, we should also be injecting failure into our application. So we actually go about doing this quite often. We dog food our own product on a continuous daily basis. But we've actually gone ahead and now have set it up that we're gonna be running game days once a month where the entire company can come together. This includes our sales teams. This includes um, our finance department where they're actually able to come and actually see how the tool works as well as how we're doing these game days and have input and actually maybe come to the table and tell us what actually happens if you do this, do that, as well as we're all in the room trying to use the tool at the same time. So a little bit of load testing gets done. We also have something that we like knowing as Takedown Thursdays. And some other places also know them as Failure Fridays. We're a completely remote company, so we actually felt that it was better to do it on Thursdays to be able to have a better uh, time with the schedule in a sense. So those actually happen every other Thursday. And we, we come together, we have a chaos captain that actually tells you how, like what we're gonna be performing chaos engineering on that day, as well as have an executed plan of the three chaos engineering experiments that we're gonna be running. And another way that we do it is that we actually have scheduled attacks running throughout our working hours during the week. We constantly just wanna have continuous chaos that even though we're not running these takedown Thursdays nor game days, we're still verifying that our systems are resilient. So I talked about game day and if you're not familiar with game day, it's a three, four hour um, event that you kind of put together. You can make it as small as just be your service be as large as your organization or as large as your company. And we have a whole bunch of resources on free templates on how to get started with running a game day, as well as the email, temp email templates, how to actually take notes when you're doing game days. Those are all available at gremlin.com slash game day. And then in the next upcoming months, we're gonna be releasing some really cool blog posts about how we actually do game days. We wanna tell folks, hey, you shall look into doing chaos engineering, but also let, let us show you how we actually do it internally. So if you go over to this bit.ly link, you would actually see the roadmap of how we're gonna be doing game days this 2019. And we've actually gone ahead, have it set up all in Yara. We have it all planned out, already scoped out into what chaos engineer experiments we're gonna be running throughout the year. And the way that we actually came up with the list of experiments we were gonna be running is by actually looking at the SRE book that Google has put out. Looking at that chapter three that has a hierarchy of basically what are the basic things that you need to be covered that are the most resilient. So it starts off at the bottom with monitoring, then going into disaster recovery to later development, capacity planning, as well as product. And we're gonna be publishing, I think every month we're gonna be talking about like the findings that we've done. I should mention that we do chaos engineering on production and we also do it in development. We see that there's a lot of value in being able to do it at both, but we completely understand that there is no environment that is going to be like production as much as you try to reproduce it. So we try to also be running these on production at all times. Thank you very much. Um, so you can find both of us on Twitter, uh, like we mentioned earlier. Uh, it's also worth 
plugging that both of our companies are hiring engineers. Uh, so if you're interested in doing this kind of work, like definitely come talk to us. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, if also if you're interested in this, uh, that bit.ly link will lead you to a Slack channel that is devoted to chaos engineering. It's a really active Slack channel with tons of, uh, tons of channels, or ton Slack workspace, sorry. <laughs> I get my terminology confused with Slack. Um, also, if you're interested in hearing more about this, there is a conference coming up in September uh, called Chaos Conf in San Francisco. The uh, CFP is still open. I think it's open until June. Um, I'm on the program committee. I should know that. But um, yeah, if you're interested in any of that, then please come talk to us. Uh, if we have time, or do we have time for questions, Ray? One minute? OK, <laughs> probably not. So definitely, if you're interested in talking more about this, like, come talk to either of us. We'll be sticking around. Yeah, for the chaos engineering, we have over 2,500 engineers all across the world that are in different parts of their chaos engineering learning, from still trying to understand why you should be doing chaos engineering to, hey, I've been doing chaos engineering in production for a few months now. These are my learnings. So it's a great place to come and learn, as well as kind of like meet up um, and like different conferences that you go to. It's a pretty great community. I also make the plug that I have a few chaos engineering community sh uh, stickers. I'll probably post a photo on Twitter so y'all can see them, but it just looks like a really cool flash sheet. Um, but yes, like Paul said, also come join us in San Francisco where we'll be leading a chaos engineering conference in September 26. So more information about that can also be found on the Slack channel or on our Twitter pages, I'm thinking too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you very much.